Okie dokie. Okay. So first thing is, um, how much COVID are you seeing in your areas? Is it, because um, I know I, I've had six patients in two weeks in tuxedo. So if that's little tuxedo, you know, I don't know. I mean, and I've had, um, all of them have been legit, but not like in the springtime where people were, you know, dying. They, they all had mainly fatigue, fever, dehydration. Uh, none of them had respiratory complaints and none of them had a, a low pulse ox or anything like that. So it was not respiratory really. It was more just the, uh, you know, the vomiting, some diarrhea, some, you know, um, dehydration and stuff. Mo every one of them, um, basically I, I treated in a house with a Pedialyte. I just sat with them, had them drink some Pedialyte and they all, uh, they all felt better. Oh, cool. So, yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, they were not very, very, you know, elderly patients and stuff, and they didn't really have any serious uh, comorbidities or anything like that, but we're able to, none of them would go to the hospital, which is kind of why we, um, why I chose to treat them because they absolutely refused to go to the hospital. They said that going to the hospital is, you know, akin to dying. Um, at least that's what they believed. So uh, it was either make them better or just RMA them and walk out, leaving them feel horrible and probably get called back again at a later time and not get any sleep. So I figured it was easier to stay at, you know, between nine and 11 o'clock at night and hydrate them than it was to go home, you know, sorry, <clears throat> go back to the station, fall asleep and then have them wake me up again. So, okay. So tonight we're going to talk about, uh, does anybody want to discuss the vaccine uh, at all? Does anybody have any questions about the vaccines that are out there before we start? Um, I don't know how, you know, people feel about taking and not feeling. I mean, just, I'm, I am not taking it right this, like right now. Um, uh, just basically, cause I had a bad experience with a, a first round vaccine back when the Limrex, the Lyme disease vaccine was out there. I, um, you know, I took it, took two doses of it. And, uh, then they recalled it from the market and said it was giving people Lyme disease like symptoms and they never put it back on the market for humans. It is back on the market for animals. Um, so I got a kind of a little bad taste in my mouth. I am going to take it at some point, um, but um, I figured I'd let other people take it first and see what happens. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so far, obviously the worst that's happened is some people have had anaphylaxis. Um, like I was telling Art a few minutes ago, a really pretty much, I would say 70, 80% of my guys who had COVID and took it all came down with fevers, shakes, you know, like very mild, I shouldn't say very mild, they were pretty sick actually, but you know, flu-like symptoms that resolved in about 24 to 48 hours. Um, universally, most people had a sore arm. Um, some people really had a sore arm, some people just a minor sore arm, um, but that was basically the extent of the symptoms other than the fever. Now, guys that never had COVID and took it had no, um, no fever, no chills, but what the literature says is that when they go for their second dose, that's when they're going to have fever and chills, but not to the, not to the degree that um, the guys who had COVID and took the first dose got. So, um, you know, obviously, if you have serious comorbidities and stuff like that, and you're going out in public, you probably should take it. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're not going out in public at all, um, and you're, you know, you're kind of isolating, um, then you'd have to make a decision if you want to wait a little bit or, you know, because there's other ones coming to market that have different, that are more like the influenza vi vaccine on how they fight the uh, virus than, than this one, these, which are um, genetically, not genetically, but um, will be the right word, but, but are designed differently to fight a different, the virus in a different way. So um, whatever. I mean, I'd say we're at about uh, beginning of the week, I'd say we're, or I'm sorry, last week, we're about 40% of our guys are taking it. Now we're probably up about 50, 55% of people have taken it. So, um, you know, and people are making their own decisions and stuff. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about airway, um, airway management, the airway adjuncts we use, and then we'll get into a little bit of respiratory and CPAP. Okay. So I won't keep you terribly long and stuff because I know it's towards the end of the week and we'll go from there. So obviously, you know, just a quick review of the anatomy of the airway. So your nasopharynx, right, which is the part of your airway uh, behind your nostrils, behind your nose, is the largest part of your airway. Um, everybody thinks their mouth is, but their mouth is pretty much filled with your tongue. So the largest part of your airway is your nose. The reason sometimes when we're short of breath, we don't want to breathe through our nose is that obviously it has this narrow opening, which makes it, you know, difficult to get a significant amount of air in and make you feel like, you know, you're breathing fine. 
Um, it is preferential from a physiologic standpoint to breathe through your nose because breathing through your nose does a couple things. It, uh, it warms the blood coming in. Now, you know that nosebleeds are common. And, and the reason nosebleeds are common is that the inside of your nasal passageways are lined with a significant amount of capillaries. So as that air travels over the, the warm blood of the capillaries, right, it warms up. Also, those capillaries leak plasma so that they actually moisten the air. And we're designed to breathe air that is moist and not dry air. So actually, later, we're going to talk about when we have a respiratory patient, giving them oxygen out of the oxygen tank without running it through a humidifier is actually detrimental to them. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So breathing through the nose, again, warms, the, warms it, humidifies it, and actually cleans it. So what you're looking at here, these little shelves that are you know, on the inside of your nasal passages along the septal wall, so on so both sides of it, um, these are called turbinates. So think of like turbulence. And they're designed that when the air comes in and hits it, it causes the air to move in a circular motion. OK, and then if there's any pollutants in the air, any dust, any particles or anything like that, it's supposed to get stuck in your hair, the cilia, you know, that's lining your airway and the, um, the mucus. Right. And the hair actually is waving all the hair that lines your airway. You have you have little cilia lining your entire airway. That's all waving upward. OK, um, the hair in your nose is not cilia, but it's just designed to trap things. And then the mucus is designed to come down. So the mucus below your esophagus is designed to come upward and the mucus above your esophagus is designed to go downward. OK, and really most of our mucus that we develop or uh, produce actually gets swallowed into our esophagus. So that's how we get rid of the vast majority of it. Obviously, some of it we sneeze out, pick out, you know, and stuff like that. But the vast majority um, we actually swallow back into our esophagus, which is why sometimes when you have, you know, a sinus infection or a severe upper respiratory infection with a lot of mucus production, you start feeling nauseous. It's just because you're producing more mucus and it's coming down into your esophagus. And sometimes that um, causes smaller children to actually vomit. And you'll see the vomit is kind of all streaked with mucus and sometimes freaks the parents out because it's not what they're expecting to see. And it may generate you know, a call to the pediatrician or in rare circumstances, a call to us. Now on a, um, well, let's just look at a little more of the anatomy. So you know, obviously you have your nasopharynx, you have your oropharynx, and then the section right by your glottic opening, right where your larynx is, the top of your trachea is either called your laryngopharynx or your hypopharynx, depending on the, the pictures you're looking at. Um, and this, you know, an, uh, anteriorly on the neck kind of lines up with your uh, Adam's apple, your thyroid cartilage. So your thyroid cartilage is kind of where your larynx is. And your larynx is the division between what we call your upper airway and your lower airway. So anything that goes through the glottic opening into the larynx, which is the top of your trachea, is really your lower airway. And anything above that is your upper airway. Now, you know you have your epiglottis, right, which when you swallow, the epiglottis comes down a tiny little bit, but your trachea actually goes up. And the combination of this coming down a little bit and your trachea going up, they kind of meet and they seal off the entrance to your trachea so that while you're swallowing, food will go posteriorly into your esophagus, right? And it'll go here. Your esophagus is a tube, but it's pretty much flat. It's muscular um, and it's flat. And if food goes into it, it actually... Um, by what a, a term called peristalsis, it actually squeezes the food and moves it down. Um, the reason your esophagus is fat, uh, not fat, flat, uh, flat, is that if not, every time you took a breath, air would be going down into your stomach. So it takes about, you know, somewhere probably around 30, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury pressure of air pressure to force it open. That's why if we bag normally, you know, we don't get crazy when we're squeezing the bag valve mask, we shouldn't get much air in the stomach. But when we overventilate, we actually open the esophagus and we start forcing air down into the stomach. And then, you know, everybody knows the consequences, which is one, they could vomit and then aspirate. Two, if we inflate the stomach with that air, the stomach is going to rise and push against the diaphragm. So it's going to become harder for that patient to breathe and harder for that patient to ventilate. So, you know, again, when you're ventilating, just kind of look for the very start of chest rise. And at that point, you will not be overventilating and getting air down into the esophagus. Um, so the adjuncts that we have, the nasopharyngeal airway and the oropharyngeal airway, um, do very little to protect an airway. Um, in other words, the term protecting the patient's airway means that no vomitus can go in their trachea. 
Um, there are some states that allow EMTs to use what's called double lumen airways, like the King Airway and the, uh, the, year, the years ago, the, um, the PTL Airway, and there was different ones that are a combu tube. Um, those are what they call blind intubation, which means you don't have to use a tool to see where you're going with it because they're actually designed to be inserted in the mouth and they go into the esophagus and there's, there's cuffs on them that seal off the esophagus and seal off above it. And then there's a hole in the middle of the tube that lines up with the trachea. So when you bag them, because there's a cuff in the back of their mouth and there's a cuff down here, air can't get anywhere but at this hole. So they're pretty good devices. Um, you know, there was a there was talk of a pilot study on those in New York State. Obviously, everything's derailed now with COVID, you know, so maybe sometime, you know, 2000, probably 22, um, that might be revised, um, especially because there's a lot of fresh blood, you know, in the uh, in the state now. It's not the older people that have been around that weren't interested in, you know, making any more work for themselves or anything like that. So now the nasal airway that we insert, and we'll see in a second, Okay, so that's designed, obviously, to slide through the nasal uh, pharynx, actually past the oropharynx, and it's supposed to sit pretty much right by the opening over here to the, um, the larynx, to the trachea. And that does nothing to keep the tongue out of the way. What it basically is is the tongue can still relax, but it's a pathway to get air past that tongue if it relaxes. And that's the real reason why that whenever we use an airway adjunct, we're still required to do a head tail chin lift. Um, you know, whatever manual maneuver you're going to do to open the airway, because most of the adjuncts don't really keep the airway completely open. So you still have to do your manual maneuvers. If a patient's intubated, then obviously it doesn't matter because you have a tube that's coming from your bag valve mask out here that's going right through the glottic opening and sitting about over here. So it doesn't matter what the tongue does because the air is going to go through the tube and go right into the, um, into the trachea. And then, you know, the oropharyngeal airway, right, the hard plastic uh, white or green plastic airway, or actually some of them are colors now, um, that's designed to kind of act as a splint, okay, and, and physically hold the tongue up out of the way, okay? So out of the two of them, the oral airway does a better job of keeping the tongue out of the way, because remember, your tongue is just a muscle. So if you're hypoxic and unresponsive, muscles relax. So if you have an unresponsive patient, you know, and they're lying supine flat on their back, just normal gravity, that tongue is going to start moving backwards. And also the epiglottis plays a little bit of a role too. So the epiglottis may, you know, partially block the airway. So out of the two of them, the oral airway is better, but obviously oral airway has limitations that the patient, you know, has to be deep, deeply unconscious enough not to have a gag reflex. So we'll talk about all the indications and contraindications to, uh, to the airways and stuff like that when we, uh, when we get to it and stuff. So again, upper airway is everything above your larynx, which is the top of your trachea. Sorry. And your lower airway is everything that's below that, okay? Um, let's see what else we have. So, I mean, I think you know, you know how your, your trachea comes down and bifurcates into your right and left main stem bronchus. Um, I think pretty much we all know that the right main stem bronchus, okay, actually is angled downward a little more than the left. So typically when people aspirate things, it comes down and falls in the right one because the left one comes off a little more horizontally. I mean, it is possible to aspirate on the left side, but statistically, you know, number wise, probably, you know, 90, 90% or even higher, most aspiration is in the right lung, unless it's a ton of fluid. And then, you know, once it starts to fill up the bronchi on the right side, it'll also go into the left side. And then, you know, off your main stem bronchi, you have smaller ones and smaller ones until you get to the little terminal ones. And at the end of all the little terminal bron uh, bronchioles is where you have your air sacs or your alveoli, right? And we know that to have gas exchange, it's just not enough to be breathing. We have to be breathing deep enough, have good enough tidal volume to get the air down into the alveoli, right? And the alveoli are not actually bags. They resemble more sponge where there's actually rooms inside of them. And the reason why is that the gas exchange actually takes place in the rooms. So the more walls there are, the more area there is for gas exchange. So if it was just one big circle, there would be less surface area because they wouldn't have all these little walls inside of it. The disease of emphysema actually 
destroys the tension of the walls and it actually does turn into a, one big bag. And that's why emphysemics have issues as far as gas exchange. And remember, if you have one big bag with no tone to it, right? There's, remember from ENT class, there's a substance in our alveoli called surfactant. And surfactant kind of increases the surface tension on the inside of this to keep it always open. So if you're not, you know, having this nice shaped with a lot of walls and at every breath, you have to force air into it, right? Like that's what the problem with the emphysemic is. They have to force air in and then they could have air trapping on the way out. Now wrapped around the alveoli are what's called your pulmonary capillaries. So gas exchange actually takes place between the pulmonary capillaries because you know capillaries are very thin walled vessels that allow things in and out of them, right? Arteries don't let things in and out of them. Veins don't let things in and out of them, only capillaries. So capillaries are where all perfusion or the exchange of good things and bad things occur. Um, so in all honesty, capillaries, first of all, you can't see a capillary, you know, with your naked eye. Um, and you have more miles of capillaries than you do any other blood vessel, right? You just don't see them. So every square inch of your body is lined with capillaries. Every organ, everything is skin, everything is lined with capillaries. And um, you know that basically, you know, the oxygen, when you're, when you're breathing in, the fresh oxygen in your alveoli is going to cross over into your capillaries and the CO2 that's in your capillaries is going to cross over into the alveoli and be exhaled. And you know that the oxygen is carried by the hemoglobin molecule, right? So once it gets into the capillary, it jumps aboard the hemoglobin molecule, which is part of your red blood cell. And the reason why is that the walls of our cells and, and all we are is, as creatures are, you know, billions of cells and they join together, you know, to do common things like, you know, all cardiac cells have to do with your heart and so and so. Um, but the, the cells have a w cell wall around them and those cell walls uh, allow certain things to come in and out of them with no issue, but other things need to be brought in by something else. So the two things we typically talk about on an EMT level would be that oxygen has to come in with hemoglobin, right? So picture the wall as, you know, having a door on it and there's a, a lock on it. So hemoglobin is able to unlock the door and bring the oxygen in. And then once the oxygen is into the cell, the cell burns it along with sugar to make energy. And then obviously the other thing is the sugar, which needs insulin to bring it into the cell. Um, the only cells that do not need insulin to bring them in are your cerebral um, cells in your brain. Uh, your brain cells will allow sugar in without insulin, which is why when you have somebody in diabetic ketoacidosis, right, their blood sugars are, you know, in the thousands, but they can't, that, none of that sugar get into the cell because there's not enough insulin. But sometimes, at least in the first week, right, because that takes a long time to develop, those patients are conscious, learn oriented because their brain is still receiving the sugar it needs because even though there's no insulin, the brain cells can receive it. When they have an altered mental status and diabetic ketoacidosis, it's not because of the sugar issues. It's actually because of the dehydration that occurs because since the sugar is so high, the body starts to have them urinate out that sugar and they get dehydrated. And also an acidosis develops. That's why it's called diabetic ketoacidosis. So really the altered mental status is from the dehydration and the acidosis. That's why it takes a while to see it. Uh, so most of the times when you get there early in diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, not that they call us early, but if you were to get there early, the patient would be conscious, learn oriented. Um, sometimes they're not a hundred percent, you know, like they may be tired and lethargic because the most common reason why a diabetic goes into DKA is that they get a viral infection right, or some type of infection. So they may just be under the weather from the actual infection. Um, so again, when we're ventilating somebody, we have to make sure that our tidal volume is adequate enough that we actually get air down to the alveoli. Because if we're just moving air in the tubes above it, right? In other words, we're just moving air in the bronchial spaces, we're not actually getting air down to the alveoli. And you could be assured that if you are getting chest rise, that you're moving air down to the alveoli. I wouldn't say you could be sure that you're getting everyone down because you can develop what's called mucus plugging if you give people dry oxygen where you start clogging off different bronchioles. And that's very common in asthmatics and young patients and stuff. And we'll talk about that as we go on. Okay, so we know there's a lot of different ways that we can have airway obstructions and we know our different maneuvers uh, to, you know, to take care of them, right? So if it's a conscious patient over the age of one, uh, we, if they're coughing, we encourage them to cough. But if they're not moving any air, then we would have to do our, our abdominal thrust or Heimlich maneuver. And there's no magic number. We continue to do it till either the object comes out or the patient becomes unresponsive. Uh, remember that you have to be, you know, down 
right, under the xiphoid, not on the stomach, right? If you're on the stomach, you're gonna have a hard time doing it. You have to actually be on the, um, underneath the xiphoid because you wanna get under the diaphragm, okay? Um, what else? If they are um, under one year of age and conscious and have an airway obstruction, then you do the back blows and chest thrusts. And there, there is a number you're supposed to do, you know, five back blows. If that doesn't work, turn them over and do five chest thrusts. If they are unresponsive, then we just get into position of CPR and we're not doing CPR to move blood. We're doing CPR to compress their sternum on their lungs and keep, uh, make some pressure to blow out the obstruction to take the residual air in the lungs and blow it out and blow out the obstruction, okay? Um, and then there's some types of airway obstructions that we can't deal with, right? So you have swelling from burns, from trauma, epiglottitis, infection, right? Those we cannot manage by any of those maneuvers. Those are all probably, if it's acute surgical fixes where there has to be an opening made into the trachea to uh, you know, allow air into. So again, on a BLS level, um, that's not something that you're gonna do. You're gonna drive fast to the hospital to be able to take care of them. Now, just to review the sounds we hear and stuff like that. So airway sounds are sounds that originate in the airway. Lung sounds are sounds that originate in the lungs. So airway sounds, we know the snoring is the sound of a partial obstruction of the tongue and somewhat also the epiglottis. Okay, if it was no snoring, right? Sometimes you hear people snoring at night and then they, they kind of stop snoring. Like <laughs> that's actually a patient who's developing, you know, sleep apnea, right? Like a, a full airway obstruction and could die from it. Um, usually then of course they start snoring again and, and that's why they don't die. But the people who die of sleep apnea, really all it is is their tongue has completely blocked their airway. Um, the gurgling sounds and stuff like that, obviously you no know, are fluid, okay? And strider, which is a kind of a rare thing to occur. Strider is when the, the, the larynx, right? The, the upper airway, where was it? This area up in here spasms. Now it could be from blood trauma, like if you were struck forcefully, you know, I don't know, like you see, um, uh, I don't know, uh, playing baseball and somebody gets hit with a ball or a bat in the neck. Um, I've, I saw it once where somebody was riding an ATV and hit a branch in the neck. Um, so it has to, you know, it has to be where it fractures the cartilage and it starts to develop swelling. Most of the time, strider is a sound um, related to an infection, right? So epiglottitis can cause strider. Um, what did they call it? Retroperitoneal abscesses can cause strider. Um, we actually had the other day a patient who had um, strider secondary to vaping, um, which you know is going to become more and more common to people who vape. They're talking this term now, metal in the metal in the lung from vaping, because I guess they're saying there's little shards of metal that get into people's lungs when they vape. Um, so that's going to be uh, you know a public health crisis in the next you know 10 to 15 years. Um, you're going to see people dying of pretty exotic reasons, you know, with the, these metal shards in their lungs and stuff like that from vaping. Um, strider is usually an inspiratory sound. Um, so it kind of like is like a very prolonged inspiratory to go. Because they can't get air in through that narrowed, um, you know, um, uh, narrowed larynx, right? And then obviously if they can't get it in, they definitely can't get it out, okay? Um, the medical treatment, so if it's strider caused by trauma, then it's surgical. They have to cut open into the trachea. If it's medical, like a croupy kid or uh, epiglottitis, um, usually they'll do nebulized epinephrine. Um, so just the same nebulizer you use for uh, albuterol, they would use epinephrine. So albuterol only works on the lower part of the lungs. It doesn't work on the larynx. Um, and the paramedics can do that. They can do nebulized epinephrine. It's pretty rare that you have to do it. Okay, so we're going to talk about asthma in a little bit. And asthma is what they call a hypersensitive airway, a hyperactive airway, where the airway responds, over responds to certain stimuli, right? We call those triggers. So again, in every asthmatic, they have different things that cause it. But when they're triggered, they have pretty, pretty quick bronchoconstriction. And when the bronchioles tighten, the sound that those bronchioles make is a whistling sound that we call wheezing. Um, now, we said strider is a primary inspiratory sound. Wheezing is actually a primary expiratory sound. The reason why is that when you breathe in, you're bringing air in a force, okay? And you're actually able to open those narrow bronchioles, okay? And they don't make the whistling sound, at least initially in asthma. But when you go to exhale, that's passive. 
So the air doesn't have the same force. So now it's trying to snake its way through the bronchioles. And it's the kind of equivalent of putting your fingers in your mouth and blowing air through it and making a whistling sound. If an asthmatic gets tighter, progresses, then they could have what they call biphasic wheezing. And you can even have biphasic strider. It just means they're worse, um, where they have the wheezing or the strider on the way in and one way out. And obviously, you've had a patient who's wheezing or who has had strider while you were with them, and then they become silent. Obviously, one thing, in other words, the sound goes away. One thing is maybe your treatment worked, but um, it could also be that they're completely closing up. And you'd know the difference because if their treatment was working, they'd be able to talk clearer. Their pulse ox would improve. They, in general, would look better. If it's closing up, then they're obviously dying, right? So they're going to have a decrease in their mental status. Their pulse ox is going to drop. They're going to be frantic and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, when we're assessing an airway, we always ask the two main questions, right? Is the airway patented or open, right? In other words, can the patient maintain it that way? And do you think there's anything that's going to endanger it? That's so anytime, those are the three classic things you always want to ask for, um, you know, an airway and stuff like that. Okay, so obviously if a patient's speaking to you and speaking clearly with no abnormal sounds, they probably have a patent airway. Um, but, you know, you still have to always look at stuff and make sure, okay? We said again, strider is the larynx, upper airway. You see that in anaphylaxis, burns. So in anaphylaxis, we can treat it because we give them a shot of epi, because epi is the drug, right? Whether it's nebulized or shot. The reason we give it as a shot, an injection in anaphylaxis is that anaphylaxis is just not an airway problem, right? It also causes very quick and profound vasodilation. And the way you combat, com, uh, combat the vasodilation is by giving epinephrine, because epinephrine is a very potent vasoconstrictor. Okay? Airway burns would have to be a surgical fix. Um, if you can get an endotracheal in to down their trachea before they swell, then you could, uh, you know, still ventilate them. You don't have to actually cut from the outside in. Okay, um, you could have um, foreign body obstruction over there. You could have blunt trauma. We said to the front of the neck, or we can have an infectious etiology. Right, croup is a viral infection. Epiglottitis is a bacterial infection. We really don't see too much of epiglottitis anymore because there's a vaccine called the HIB, H-I-B uh, vaccine that pretty much covers epiglottitis, the bacterial part of epiglottitis. So uh, you don't see it that that much unless you're dealing with a large population of non-immunized uh, kids. Um, in fact, most epiglottitis now is not in young kids anymore. It's actually in people in their 20s and 30s where the vaccine, if they either didn't take the vaccine when they were younger because it wasn't available or the protection has worn off. Again, snoring, we said, is the partial obstruction caused by the tongue and somewhat the epiglottis. The gurgling is fluids. We know we have suction for that. Okay. Um, and again, airway has to be constantly monitored, right? It's not just, you know, the start of the fall, you know, the airway is good and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay. Um, the best sign that nobody has an airway problem is if they're talking as fast as I am, right? So if they're talking in full sentences and no trouble whatsoever, you know that they're probably not having an airway problem. They may say to you they are but they're probably not having an airway problem. Just think when you decide to, you know, exercise or even if you decide to take a brisk walk, right? I mean, like when we, when we walk for health reasons, you know, if we're walking with someone, we should be walking fast enough that you're not having a real good conversation, right? You guys should be shorter, kind of, I don't want to say short of breath where you can't breathe, but you should be walking fast enough that you're not having this long and detailed conversation with people because you're, you know, trying to catch your breath. Obviously, when you start getting in really good shape, then that's not an issue. But when you're first starting out, you want to walk briskly enough that you're kind of feeling like you have to catch your breath. And I wouldn't do that the first day, but I'm saying once you kind of, you know, a week or two into getting back in shape, you know, you should try to walk brisk enough that you're kind of a little, a little winded. And then you'll see, you know, after the next week goes by, you're going to be able to walk a little further before you feel that way and so on and so on. Um, you know, again, we could always look at chest rise as an indication. Like, so when people have fractures and uh, pneumothoraxes and stuff like that, they may have uneven chest rise. Um, but, you know, the most common thing is kind of listening to their speech and stuff like that. Okay, so we know opening the airway, right? So we know that we have to do our manual maneuvers. Typically the head tilt chin lift is the maneuver we use. There is the theoretical concern that if somebody has a spinal cord injury, a head tilt chin lift can exacerbate it. So the rule basically is if you suspect somebody has a spinal cord injury, you would try to open the airway with minimal movement of the neck by using the jaw thrust. But that if you could not open the airway, you could not establish an airway, you can't ventilate that patient if they need to be ventilated with a jaw thrust, then you do do the head tilt chin lift because airway takes precedence over spinal cord injury. 
which means that, you know, if we choose not to do a head tilt chin lift in a possible spinal cord injury patient, they're either going to be dead or have an anoxic brain injury. But we, you know, and we're doing that because we suspect that we don't know that they have a spinal cord injury. And it's pretty rare for people to have spinal cord injuries. So we're like worried about the spinal cord injury. And most of the times they don't have one. And now we don't ventilate them the right way. And they have a, you know, they wind up having an anoxic brain injury and being, you know, brain dead. Um, so again, head tilt chin lift is the main maneuver we use, jaw thrust if possible in patients who have um, possible spinal cord injuries and stuff like that. So that's the typical head tilt chin lift. Um, in kids, we don't go quite as far back. We put them in what's called a sniffing position. Now with real small babies, they're just saying to put in a head in a neutral position, um, not even to tilt it, just to keep it in a neutral position. Sniffing means you're just tilting the head back a little bit, like when you take a sniff. And remember in the small kids that the occiput tends to be very pronounced. So sometimes you have to put some uh, blankets or towels under their shoulder to, um, you know, to um, um, even out the, the fact that their head is, the occiput is so pronounced, right? So you just want to keep, be able to keep the head. You don't want, in other words, if this is very pronounced, it's going to flex the airway this way, right? And it's going to close off the airway. So you just build up under the shoulders to be able to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, again, in kids, just probably neutral to sniffing position is fine. This is what could go wrong when it, because of the occiput, right, that they flex forward and close their airway off and stuff like that. And by putting some towels under their shoulders, you kind of put their head in that neutral position to be able to ventilate them. That's actually what they're recommending now, even with intubation on adults, is to kind of pad up underneath their shoulders uh, a little bit to, to help with intubation and stuff like that. Again, the jaw thrust will only work in an unconscious patient because if not, the muscles are just too tight to allow you to do it. And what you're basically doing is feeling down for the 90 degree angle of the mandible, right? There's like a little 90 degree angle right here. And you're pushing upwards and displacing the jaw towards the ceiling. And the tongue is attached to the mandible, to your lower jaw. So the, if you're displacing it upward, you're gonna clear it out of the airway. Again, it's not a... It's not really a great technique. It's all we have. And remember, you're probably going to be doing this holding a mask over the patient's face because if you're thinking of doing this, you're probably thinking of ventilating the patient. So it's not a great device. If you can keep the airway open this way and still see chest rise, then do it, you know, and, and no issues. But if you can't see chest rise when you're ventilating the patient, you have to default to the head tail chin lift. And again, I just would minimize the amount you're pulling, you know, just, just open the airway until you can get air in. Okay, again, kids are much harder because they have no neck. So it's a little harder to do that position. But again, it's pretty rare where you're gonna have a small, small baby, you know, with a suspected spinal cord injury and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so we talked about that. The recovery position, obviously, we all know means we're putting the patient on their side. It doesn't matter, left or right side. You know, those of you that have been doing this for a long time, you remember we, you know, they used to tell us the left side, but it doesn't really matter, okay, because obviously anatomically your trachea is on the center in the midline, so it doesn't matter. Um, just in case they were to vomit, it would just help prevent aspiration and stuff like that. In most ambulances, especially van ambulances, you have to put them on their left side because you're probably going to be on the bench. And if you put them on the right side, they're going to be, you know, you're not going to be able to see their, their chest and their mouth. Um, but in the bigger ambulances that have that CPR seat, um, you can put them on either position. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So recovery position. Um, so airway adjuncts. So the first thing is, you know, again, just to reinforce is that Airway adjuncts, oral airways, nasal airways have to be used in conjunction with a manual airway maneuver. So in other words, you still have to do your head tilt chin lift or your modified jaw thrust, okay? And again, we have oropharyngeal airways, nasopharyngeal airways. Some people just say oral airway because it's easier or, or OPA um, or, you know, NPA or uh, nasal airway, however you want to refer to it and stuff like that. Again, they're not long-term solutions. They don't protect the airway. They just help keep the tongue out of the way, okay? So... So what do we want to talk about? So, you know, oropharyngeal airways have to be on a patient who has no gag reflex. I put here unconscious because, you know, you could have a conscious patient with no gag reflex, it, you know, like a stroke and stuff like that. Um, but in that case, it's probably better for a, a nasal airway than an oral airway. Um, so again, we're typically using it on a patient that we're thinking we need to ventilate that's unconscious, that has snoring respirations that we could not clear up with uh, a manual head tilt, okay? Um, and we're using it both therapeutically and diagnostically, right? So we're therapeutically, we're using it to keep the tongue up out of the way. But diagnostically, if you think about it, we're using it as a, a mental status assessment because if you were to insert that in the patient and they gagged, so even though you thought they were unconscious, they're not deeply unconscious if they have a gag reflex still. 
you still need to protect their airway. You still need to have suction available. But somebody who retches and gags it went on, a, on insertion of an oral airway, and obviously you have to take it out, um, is not as deeply unconscious as somebody who accepts it. Okay? And we'll just talk about some different ways uh, that we're going to put it in. Our biggest concern when we put an oral airway in is that we're going to kind of force the tongue downward and obstruct the airway. But you know, you know that there's ways of uh, putting it in there and stuff like that. It's always recommended whenever you do airway procedures that you have suction available. Okay. And if the patient were to start gagging, when you put it in, you actually just pull it out following the curve of the airway. You don't twist or anything like that. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, you know, obviously there are many different sizes, many different colors. Doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a solid, doesn't matter if there's a groove, you're never going to snake a suction catheter down through here very easily or anything like a flexible suction catheter. That's what these channels are designed for and stuff. It's, it's, you'll never get it to go down. It's a pain in the ass. Um, so, you know, and most of the times we're not using flexible suction catheters. We're using the rigid ones anyway. Now sizing. So, you know, there's two ways to size. This is the way I like, because this is the way the airway actually sits in the patient's mouth. So I lay the top of it in the center of their mouth because that's where it's going to be. And then it's supposed to come down to the angle of the jaw. Right, so that would give you a rough idea. It's not an exact science. So if you if you get a you size it and you have a you know you get a particular measurement, and you try to insert that size oral airway in and it doesn't go, it just won't fit. Then go to a smaller size because this is not an exact uh, measurement. Okay, or if you if you pick the size and it doesn't look like it's actually going past the tongue, then you may need to get a larger one. So it's just a rough estimate. And then the other way would be that you go from the corner of the mouth to the uh, earlobe. Right, so you go the other way. Um, so either way is considered acceptable um, as far as inserting it and stuff like that. Okay, so obviously the patient has to be flat. You have to open their mouth. The textbook way of opening a patient's mouth is the cross finger technique, uh, where you kind of, you know, go like this. Whoops, where is it? You go like this with your fingers, you know, and you have one, one finger on the upper set of teeth, one finger on the lower, and then you kind of cross over and open it. Um, I don't do that. I just put my one hand here, one hand here, and open their mouth. It's much easier. Um, I don't know why that technique was necessarily invented or anything like that. Um, and then when you're putting it in, you know that you put it in opposite the curve. So the pharyngeal curve goes this way, right? This is the way the pharynx curves. So you put it in to about, you get to the halfway point on the teeth. And you're just doing that so that when you twist it, you're actually somewhat below the tongue. Um, the other way to do it would be to use a tongue depressor or rigid suction and manually hold the tongue out of the way. And then you could put it back in put it in a normal way, which is kind of the way we're supposed to do it with kids. Okay, so that's how you would insert it in. Um, again, it tends to get uh, rotated 180 degrees, right? If you have it this way and it needs to go this way, so you're gonna put it in and then turn it 180 degrees to get it in place. Um, as far as where to flange the, the hard white plastic, this thing, where it sits on, you know, it doesn't really matter. It could sit on the teeth, it could sit on the lips. I like to put it on the lips because you don't know Sometimes if they have false teeth, you know, by looking at them, you don't know if the teeth have maybe been are loose. So I tend to like to put it on the um, on the lips. It does leave a mark if you put it on the lips, but uh, it goes away once they pull it out and stuff like that. Uh, again, sizing we talked about. Okay, so they're putting it in following the curve. Okay, and then they twist it again. Usually, when the teeth. So here's the teeth when, you know, I usually have it more resting this way. Usually when it gets about halfway, that's when I twist it back the other way uh, going, okay? Um, be careful, obviously, you know, putting your fingers in patient's mouths as far as biting, you know, or they don't, they're not biting intentionally. It's just a, the gag reflex. If the patient, once it's in, starts to gag, then you just pull it right out, right? In other words, you don't twist it out. You pull it right out so it's curved like this in here. So you just pull it right out. Okay, because if you twist it, it's just going to make them gag more. Um, and that's kind of how it sits, right? So it kind of wants to split, splint the tongue up out of the way. Okay, um, OPAs and, and MPAs, I'm sorry, OPAs in small, smaller patients, what they basically, this is called, so you have your, your hard palate and then you have your soft palate, um, the upper part of your mouth. So that somebody felt that the twisting of it um, could scar or rip it. So they don't want us to put it in and reverse it on kits because of that. I don't think it really does, but that's what they say. So, you know, what they want us to do is displace the tongue out of the way with a tongue depressor, which we don't carry, um, uh, or a rigid suction catheter to kind of hold the tongue up out of the way and then insert it in. 
I'll just say if you're going to do it that way, then have somebody shine a light so you can actually see what you're doing. It's very hard to, especially with a rigid suction catheter, to completely get the tongue up out of the way. Um, you could grab the tongue, um, but if you're going to grab the tongue, obviously you have to have gloves on and you need to have a four by four. You can't grab a tongue with just gloves. It'll slip right out. So you actually grab the tongue with a four by four and you could hold it up out of the way and then put it down, uh, be able to do it that way. So that's what they're showing you here, displacing the tongue. And then they would insert it just following the curve of the pharynx. Um, so before I go on to nasal airways, I did, I talked uh, a lot. So does anybody have any questions um, on what we went over so far? Everybody's good? Okay. Am I going too fast? Am I talking too much? <laughs> well, if Artie's not saying I'm talking too much, then I'm going to go a little longer. And he's still awake, so I must be doing a good job. Okay, so nasopharyngeal airways, there's a lot of different types, right? Um, so again, those of you who have been doing it for a long time, remember the original nasal airways were just a like kind of like a real flexible um, plastic tube, and it didn't have a flange, but it used to come with a safety pin. And the per nobody, you know, in the beginning, nobody had any idea what the safety pins were for it. But what happened is after we started using them, remember we were lubricating them and putting them in patients' noses. And most of the times, nasal airways are patients who are, you know, breathing on their own, right? They they just may have had a stroke or a postictal from a seizure. So they're breathing on their own. And what happened is they disappeared from sight because there was no flange. So as the patient was breathing, because they were well lubricated, they used to disappear from sight. And then people figured out that the purpose of the safety pin was to actually just pin right here through it. Um, you don't attach it to the patient's skin or anything like that. You just, you know, put it right through here so that when it went into the nose, it would stop. Um, because what happened before was it would disappear from sight and everybody would be looking at each other going, you know, didn't we put a, a nasal airway in? And then you'd have to fish down into their mouth and kind of find it and pull it back out. So it was kind of an issue. Uh, but now they all have some kind of flange. This one I put up here because this is the best nasal airway there is. This is called a ruche. They're expensive, but this round disc moves. So what happens is when we're sizing it, right, we're sizing length and we're sizing diameter. So you really want to put the largest diameter airway you can in that nose, okay, that nostril. Um, but sometimes, you know, depending, people may have a big opening where you can get a pretty big nasal airway in, but they're short. So now the problem is it's going to go too far down. But when you have a movable flange, you could put a real fat one in, right, and you could change the length of it to fit a smaller patient. So that's the nice thing about the ruche. Um, and you know, it's whatever, it is probably about two to three times the price of the, the green ones and stuff like that, where they have the, uh, like, uh, where is it? Like those where the flange is kind of molded into it, but they, they are very, very nice, uh, you know, nice uh, airways. Now, who gets a nasopharyngeal airway? So if somebody, you tried to put an oropharyngeal airway and they retched or gagged, okay, that would be uh, one candidate. Did I forget to hit record? Uh, please, no, I remembered. Um, that would be one candidate, okay. Um, but the typical ones are the postictal seizure patients that are not coming around and they have snoring respirations that you can't get rid of by positioning their airway. Sometimes you can have a patient who has a stroke that involves the part of the brain that controls their airway. Um, so that may be a candidate, right? Um, you know, so again, sometimes you could have somebody who is kind of under the influence of medications, but not deeply unconscious. So it's, it's basically a good airway in somebody who's a little out of it, but not deeply. So they still have a gag reflex. You can't use an oral airway. So it's a kind of good airway with that. But there's also obviously contraindications. So on the oral airway, the big contraindication we said is that they still have a gag reflex or they have trauma to their mouth, right? That you're afraid that some, a tooth is going to get loose or something like that. The nasopharyngeal airway, okay, would be obviously trauma to their nose. Or if you think they're snorting cocaine or, or uh, meth or something like that, where they have a lot of cartilage destruction with that, you know, um, you might want to be a little cautious. Um, but the big contraindication is that we suspect there could be what's called a basilar skull fracture. So a basilar, the basilar skull is the flat plate, okay, that kind of runs like this, right? So it comes from back here, and then it goes right up under the eyes above the nose. So it kind of is like a, a cup. Um, and the only big hole in the basal skull is this, the foramen magnum. And this is where your spinal cord comes up and connects into your medulla, into your brain stem. So remember your brain is the computer and then the, the wires um, are your nerves. And the big first big wire is your spinal cord, right? So that's where it kind of comes up and connects. There's some other small superficial holes, obviously to bring up your carotid arteries and your vertebral arteries and stuff like that. And have other nerves 
your different cranial nerves that don't go through your spinal tract, leave through there and stuff like that. So if somebody has a fracture, okay, of their basal or plate, then you could have some certain bleeding problems. Now, the reason we're concerned about it as far as a nasal airway goes, so this is the front right of your skull. This is kind of we're looking over here. So picture you're sticking up a nasal airway and the fracture is right, you know, over here. So it could go technically go up and into what they call the cranial vault, which is, you know, your skull where your brain is. Um, I don't think it can, to be honest with you. If the crack was that big, you know, the, you'd have brain matter coming out of your nose or their mouth or something like that. The reason there's this theoretical precaution is there is a picture, uh, I guess actually I say a picture, an x-ray of a patient probably in the 50s or 60s that must have been a, uh, well, not must have, was a head trauma patient, okay, who they passed a nasal gastric tube in. A nasal gastric tube is like a long, flexible nasal airway, that we, the nasal suction catheter that we would use. So it kind of looks like a long spaghetti type of thing. And when somebody's unconscious to empty their stomach, what happens is you have them, you put it up their nose, you have them swallow, and it goes down into their esophagus because they're swallowing, and then you can put suction on it and empty their stomach. This guy, obviously, because he turned out to have a basal skull fracture, was unconscious. And when you do it in an unconscious patient, it's all feel. So you kind of put it in. Again, they're not swallowing, so you start to advance it, and you kind of, it's a 50-50 chance. I shouldn't say it. It's probably more like a, an 80% chance it's going to go in the esophagus, but there's a chance it could go into the trachea. So at whenever they put a nasogastric tube in, they always shoot a uh, chest x-ray to make sure it's actually in the esophagus. And this guy, they must have shot it and saw it wasn't in the esophagus. And then they're like, uh-oh. So the next thing you do is look in their mouth and see if it just curled up right as you were putting it in their nose where they could just curled up. I guess it wasn't there. So then they shot an x-ray of the guy's head. And there it was, all snaked up in the, in the, you know, in the skull. So... I would assume that is the reason why they tell us not to do it. I've never, ever heard of somebody taking a nasal airway in a skull fracture patient, a basal skull fracture patient, and sticking it up into their cranial vault. But there, it isn't protocol. It is kind of like taboo to do it, so we don't really you know, ever do it. Now, we have early signs of a basal skull fracture and late signs. The early signs would be blood or cerebral spinal fluid coming from the nose or the ears, and the late sign would be getting bruising around the eyes. It's called periorbital ecchymosis. In the antique book, they call it raccoon's eyes or bruising behind the ear over the mastoid bone that they call battle signs. Um, so because bruising takes a while to develop, those are considered late signs, right? So now cerebral spinal fluid, for the most part, is clear fluid uh, with a little yellowish tint to it. Um, and if there's blood in it, you know, it'll be obviously have a little bit of a pinkish. Um, most trauma textbooks say you actually need an otoscope to be able to look up into the ear and see it, that it doesn't actually flow out to this degree. So it's not really a good sign um, of looking. And again, just remember that if you have a patient who has a scalp laceration, you may have blood coming down and dripping into the ear just from the scalp laceration. So it may not be that it's actually coming from the ear. This was somebody with a perforated eardrum, you know, where they had some uh, cerebral spinal fluid leaking out and stuff like that. And then the bruising over the mastoid, okay, which is the mastoid is a bone that kind of hangs down over here that you have a muscle that goes to your jaw that connects to it. So when you, that's helps you open and close your uh, jaw. So again, these are going to be late signs, right? And the periorbital ecchymosis are going to be late signs because it takes a while for a bruise to actually develop. This is actually using, again, an, an otoscope and looking in the ear, and they could see the bruise on the inside of the ear a lot earlier than they could see it on the outside. So we don't carry those, you know, we don't carry those otoscopes or anything. So most of the times you're not going to be 100% certain of the late signs because you know, I've had two times I had late signs. I had a guy that we found unconscious in front of an ATM. Uh, the job came in at like six o'clock in the morning, you know, and uh, what it turned out to be on surveillance so security camera was the guy was laying out there for hours. He had come, you know, whatever, one, two o'clock in the morning to get money out. And somebody came up behind him and, and clubbed him in the head, and stole his money. And he was just laying there the whole time till the next person came to get money, which was around five or six o'clock in the morning and found him laying there. So he had some mild bruising that developed that we didn't even notice because it was dark out. And we really only kind of noticed it en route to the hospital um, that he had. And then the other one was a guy that was laying out on, uh, on uh, Route 202 uh, with his dog kind of laying on and protecting him. And it was the same thing. He was walking his dog um, at night and uh, a truck must have went by or something, a pickup truck with, a, with extended mirrors and whacked him. It's the only thing they could think of. And what happened was that uh, he used to take the dog for the last walk um, after his wife went to bed. So she was sound asleep. He went out to walk the dog and he got hit and she didn't notice he was missing 
until the morning. And then, uh, you know, she called and they found them laying on the ground type of thing. So uh, other than that, I've never really seen anybody with any kind of bruising or anything like that. So nasal airways come in a lot of different sizes. They even have pediatric nasal airways, although I'd be very cautious on kids, especially if they're prone to nosebleeds inserting in there and stuff like that. Also, if you find patients, again, I know it's hard to know, but if they live in a house that has forced air, dry, you know, forced air heating, they tend to be very dried out, so they're more prone to bleeding. Um, so we'll talk about how we're going to measure it, but you know it needs to be lubricated. It needs to be lubricated with a water-soluble, not Vaseline, KY jelly, surgery lube, but it can't be Vaseline. Vaseline is petroleum-based, and it doesn't go away. So if you were to lubricate this with Vaseline, that Vaseline would stay in his nose for quite a long time. But water-soluble lubricants break down very quickly. Um, so we size it basically from their, from their nostril, okay, down to the angle of their jaw. Um, nobody really talks too much about the size of the pinky, you know, as far as diameter or anything like that. But once you get the length, then you're going to go and look at the nostril and see if it looks like you might be able to snake a little bit of a bigger one um, in there than you think you can. Because again, diameter is important. But length is also important because if it's too short, it's not going to go past the tongue. And if it's too long, let me see if I have a picture. No, let's go back to here. Oops. So the, let me see now, this will be it. So in other words, it's going to come like this, and it needs to be about here. So if it's too short and it's over here, the tongue is going to flop back and block it, okay? But if it's too long and it continues to advance down, it's going to point towards the esophagus, and then every breath is going to, more, more of that air is going to go into the esophagus. So sizing is important, right? Diameter is important, but sizing is probably a little more important because you, you know, too short doesn't work and too long will just make them more likely to have gastric distension and stuff like that. Um, what else? So we know we need to lubricate it. Um, the, way, the way I do it is I put three pairs of gloves on, okay? And then I put the KY jelly and lubricate the, uh, the outer part of this, you know, and I go pretty far up. But then I also put some KY jelly on my pinky and I stick it up their nostril. And typically, obviously, because the way the bevel's cut, you're going to be going in the right nostril, okay? Um, so um, you're going to uh, lubricate up there, and then I take those gloves off, so I have a kind of a dry, clean pair, and then I insert it in. Um, when you're inserting it in, hold it down by the base. Don't hold it up here and try to snake it in because it's going to bend, but hold it down towards the, the base. Um, I'm sorry, down towards the tip, okay? And then you're going to do what's called a pig nose, which means you're going to pull back on the nose, and I'll show you in a second. Remember, you're inserting it right, that you want it to drop it straight down. It's going to go in maybe this much, right, about to here on the nose, and it's going to go right down. Don't try to drive it this way because that's it's not going to go anywhere, right? It's going to hit the base of the basal or skull. It's just not going to go anywhere. So really, it only has to go in a little bit, and then it's going to curve downward. And again, they're so flexible that they curve pretty much on their own. So again, a water-soluble lubricant. Pull back on the nose and make what they call the pig's nose. I hold it a little further down. You have a little more control over it. And then you just wiggle it and send it down. Now you see they have it with the bevel. You don't see the bevel. The bevel is facing the septum, right? So the septum is the, the, the bone that divides the right and left nostril. And that's so that it could slide over those turbinates, those shelves that we talked about. Um, they do say you can recut it. Like let's say you meet resistance in the right nostril. I've never ever met resistance, but let's say, I don't know, a guy's got a deviated septum or something. Um, and you meet resistance. They say you can recut it. Um, to face the other way. It doesn't have to be sterile scissors because you're sticking your fingers in your nose, you know, they're not sterile and stuff like that. Um, or what I usually do, like at least in practice, is I just actually take it and face the bevel, right? So now the, the bevel is actually going to be facing us, go in the left nostril. It's totally pointing the wrong way. So instead of pointing like this, it's pointing like that. And I just slowly advance it while I'm wiggling and it'll actually bend and go the right way because it's so flexible. So you don't have to bother about recutting or anything. Again, pig's nose, and you see, this is the really right way to do it, where they're kind of dropping it straight down. You do need to angle it in the very beginning because it needs to go up a little bit. But once it goes up, maybe not even an inch, maybe more like a half inch, you know, the opening is right there, and then it's just going to go right down, okay? And you want it to go, you know, basically it should wind up somewhere right about at the, the mandible, okay? And that would be the, the right position for it to be in. I've never had a patient gag. I've never had a patient anything with it. I've had postictal seizure patients that we put nasal airways in, and they're sitting up 
you know, an hour later waiting for the labs to come back, they don't even know it's in their nose, right? They don't even find out it's in their nose until they go to blow their nose or they go to the bathroom to clean up before they go home. So once it's in there, it's pretty well tolerated and stuff like that. Um, okay, so any questions on the nasal airway? Okay, so suctioning, I think we know is pretty, pretty simple. Um, you know, for suction to work, you have to have a machine that can generate enough suction and you have to have a decent diameter suction catheter. In fact, a lot of times we just actually use the suction tubing, right? If you have somebody with a lot of blood or big chunks of food or whatever clots, uh, the suction tubing is actually the best thing to do, okay? Um, than, the, um, than the suction catheters, okay? So typically, you know, it has to have about 30, 300 millimeters of mercury pressure. That's actually a, when the state inspects it, they put a little gauge on it to make sure that it's actually generating um, that amount of suction. Okay, um, so the wall one is the best. Okay, the battery ones again, you get what you pay for. So you know the the, um, the layered alls are very good, but you don't have to buy a layered all. The company that makes the layered all is called the Bliss. So you could buy a the Bliss suction. It's gray instead of yellow and blue, but it's the exact same thing. All layered all does is have them put a different color case on it, and they mark it up like 200 bucks. Everything fits on it, the canisters, everything, the battery is the same. There's no difference whatsoever. So the real company is this company, the Bliss, and they make a lot of different airway equipment. And then, you know, all Laredo does is, is relicense it with their name on it and stuff like that. So that's a quick way of saving some money. Personally, I think these are useless. They satisfy, and there's different types of, of um, manually operated suction devices. There's the white one, there's this one. Um, uh, if that's all you have, obviously it's better than nothing, but really it doesn't do a great, great job in suctioning. Um, you know, but if that's all you have, it's fine. Like if you have, uh, you know, you designate your personal vehicles as first response vehicles, well, you have to have suction. Well, you know, if you have 20 vehicles, you're not going to go out and buy 20 battery out of operated suctions unless you have an unlimited budget. So this satisfies the requirement of having suction from the state standpoint. So we always put a manually operated suction in our equipment so that if the state comes and checks and for some reason the battery doesn't work or it doesn't generate the 300, um, believe it or not, this will generate 300 when you pull it back. So this is one way of around it, you know, getting around the state inspection and stuff. Then you know you have to have your rigid suction catheters. You really want to look for and buy one called the big stick. That's the only one that has a big diameter opening on it. All the ones you get in the hospital are kind of tiny but there's a company that makes one just designed for EMS. It was probably some EMTs and paramedics, right? That decided, you know, we'll just make our own because the ones that are out there are so horrible. Um, but it's called the big stick. And that's really the only one that uh, does a good job in, you know, getting solid objects and stuff like that out. Um, and you know that most of them have a little uh, finger hole over here that there's no suction actually coming through it until you put your finger over there, right? So you can go in with the suction running and not worry about catching the tongue or the cheek or anything. And then when you get down to the back of the oropharynx, you put your finger over here, and then you have a figure eight kind of motion, um, you know, figure eight kind of motion, trying to get into all the different corners to pull out the secretions. We are allowed to suction on a BLS level to the back of the oropharynx. Um, typically, that's going to be about, you know, where you see the curve in the uh, in the suction catheter. I mean, again. Nothing's going to happen if you go a little deeper. I wouldn't try to go shallow because you're not going to get to where the fluid is. So you need to, again, if you have somebody with a little light, even if it's a phone light, to, to shine down so you could actually see where the pockets of fluid are so you can actually get it out. Um, and again, remember when you're suctioning someone, you're not giving, you know, the only obvious things, you're not ventilating them, you're removing air. You could cause a vagal response and braiding them down, but, you know, we're not suctioning excessively. We'll go over times and stuff like that in a second. The flexible suction catheters come in different sizes. On a BLS level, personally, I think they're kind of useless. Um, maybe to have some of the smaller sizes, if God forbid you have a little baby born and uh, you know they really need some, like they have meconium, uh, st meconium staining, they have the fecal um, product that, you know, unfortunately they went to the bathroom basically in, in the um, amniotic sac. Um, the bulb syringe doesn't do a great job. So, you know, you may be able to do a little bit of a better job with the flexible suction catheter. The only other time you would need a flexible suction catheter is you're, if you're suctioning a trach, 
but those patients that have trachs typically have their own suction kits right right by their bedside it's in a sterile little package that has water and a suction catheter and everything like that and they typically most of the times if they're conscious they know how to suction themselves or the family knows how to suction them so i usually just let them uh, do the suctioning and stuff Okay, again, the suction catheters do have that same little flutter valve that there's no suction until you put your finger over it, or they call it a whistle valve sometimes. Um, and, you know, sizing and stuff like that would be, you know, basically, you're, again, since you're only allowed to suction the oropharynx, you're going to measure from the nose to the angle of the jaw, right? You're not going to be going uh, much further. So it's kind of what they're showing over there. Um, whenever you're doing any airway procedures, right, you have to have, especially now in a COVID environment, you have to have face shield. I would go with a full face shield, you know, your N95 or better um, mask on, uh, ideally a half face respirator or even a PAPR device. We actually now are equipping all our paramedics with the, you know, the hood with the air fan blowing into it and everything like that. Um, but airway procedures are absolutely the most dangerous procedures. And you also have to have viral filters uh, on your bag valve masks on your CPAP and on your nebulizers. If you don't have viral filters, then do not perform those procedures if it's a suspected COVID patient, because all you're doing is having them fill the back of the ambulance with virus. And, and if you did do those procedures, um, you know, don't go into the hospital with those on, just wait outside, tell the hospital, oh, we're giving him a treatment, or, you know, we're giving him a nebulizer, we're giving him, we have him on CPAP, and let them getting negative pressure room ready for you. And they're probably going to have you shut everything off until you get back in that negative pressure room. If not, you're going to basically douse the entire emergency room with, with COVID virus. So we, we are really very, very minimally doing nebulizers, CPAP. Um, you know, we're not really aggressive with codes on COVID patients and stuff like that um, because of that. Now we do have viral filters. So, you know, it's a little safer. And viral filters are just disposable little filters that you would put on the exhalation port of those various different devices so the COVID can't actually get out. Um, you can now get a viral filters again, but for a while they just couldn't, you know, you couldn't find them because everybody bought them up. But uh, they're cheap. They're, you know, $2 or something like that. And that would offer you a little bit of protection. But again, if you're the people in the back of the ambulance, you really have to make sure that you have a fit tested, you know, N95 better mask on and real eye protection, not, not like you know, those little disposable glasses. I mean, it needs to be a full face shield or a, a goggles that are sitting firmly and they're and non-vented, right? You don't want vented ones where there's an opening for stuff to come in before you do any airway procedures. This is our highest risk, uh, you know, procedures, airway procedure on COVID patients, okay? Um, so suctioning again, typically 15 seconds on adult, 10 seconds on a child, five seconds on an infant. Okay, again, the risk is hypoxia and bradycardia, hypoxia because we're pulling air out and not ventilating and bradycardia because we may, one from the hypoxia, but also because we may stimulate um, um, the uh, gag reflex, right? The vagal uh, reflex when we do that, just like sometimes people pass out with a strep test and stuff like that because you're touching back in the area where there's a lot of influence from the vagus nerve. Um, most, most of the times, if you have not cleared the airway and their heart rate is not decelerating, you're going to suction for longer than the 15 seconds or the 10 seconds or the five seconds, because again, you're trying to reduce the risk of aspiration, but you'd be guided by their heart rate. If you see their heart rate starting to drop, then you would need to stop um, suctioning them, okay, and, until you can get their heart rate back up to a, a better number. Okay, again, we only suction on the way out. You know, we kind of know all that stuff. We want to move back and forth, not just leave it in one place. Uh, what else? So that's really basically, I think, everything. Just wanted to show you, this is the airway I think would be ideal for EMTs. In all honesty, you know, the whole Warwick EMS, you know, Pine Island, Greenville Lake, Warwick, you guys really should probably pick, I don't know, 10 or 15 of your most active members and train them to the advanced EMT level. Um, it's a, it's, I don't want to say it's a quick class, but it's a, it's a class that builds upon EMT um, and you know, then you would be allowed to use these airways. And, um, you know, again, maybe the state's going to allow EMTs, but, um, you know, because of the fact that you don't always have 100% ALS coverage, you know, and you pretty much have all the tools you need to save a patient in cardiac arrest, right? You have CPR or Lucas, right? So you're going to be doing good CPR. 
um, and you have the AED, the AED and, and CPR, or what they call high performance CPR, like really effective CPR, are the only two things by study that have been proven to save patients in cardiac arrest. And we know that the only patients in cardiac arrest we can save are fresh VFib patients, right? We don't typically save asystole patients. We don't typically save PEA patients. The survival rate of those is almost nil. Um, but a fresh VFib patient, right, we can do good CPR, keep them perfused and defibrillate them, reset their heart, and they're going to be in good shape. The problem is that if their brain is anoxic from the lack of oxygen, they're not going to wake up right away, and they're going to be unconscious. And if they vomit, then they have an aspiration problem and they, you know, and they may not survive because of that. So if you had an airway kind of like this, you would save them. So what happens is it's obviously package deflated. Okay. There's no, you know, um, cups inflated and stuff like that. The size you use is five sizes are based on the length of the patient. So you guesstimate the length. It tells you right on the thing, what sizes it's for. And what you do is you put the head in a neutral position. You don't hyperextend. You pick the right size. And then you just slide the airway down and there's lines. So you pick the like middle line, line it up on the teeth, okay? And when you get it down to what you think is the right position, you put a syringe on it. it the, each one tells you how much air, it comes with the syringe, tells you how much air. So it's somewhere, you know, some of the largest is about 60 milliliters of air down into it. And what happens is it inflates this cuff and it inflates this cuff. So right away, you're gonna say, where's the air come out? So what happens is the air comes down the tube and there's a hole right here. It can't go back out the mouth because this cuff is in the posterior uh, oropharynx or yeah, oropharynx. Can't go down the esophagus because this cuff is here. So what it does is it comes up and it goes right up the glottic opening into the trachea. So it's a great device to get near perfect tidal volumes and pretty much, you know, reduce the risk of aspiration close to zero. So it's, it's a great, great, great device. Uh, just, you know, under full disclosure, there was a study that looked at these in uh, animals. And during a cardiac arrest, which obviously is a low blood flow state, they found that this cuff and somewhat this cuff decreased the amount of carotid blood flow to the brain. Okay. So obviously there's not a great carotid blood flow to the brain in cardiac arrest to start with. Remember the blood that goes up to your brain, you have your carotids and you have your vertebrals. So it's four arteries coming up to your brain. This one kind of diminished, didn't shut off, but diminished somewhat in animals. It didn't, obviously, it wasn't recreated in, uh, in humans, but it's somewhat in animals uh, decreased the amount of blood flow um, in it. So that's the only issue, but the FDA did not uh, pull them, you know, because these are, you know, very vital air, airways in general. You know, I mean, we use them if we can't intubate, right? So you can't intubate someone for some reason. This is your emergency or backup airway. Um, to, uh, to make sure you can get a, a better definitive airway in. So they're good devices uh, to be able to put in patients and stuff like that. Um, let me just, yeah, I don't think there's anything else in here. Let me just bring up one other one. We'll go through it quickly and then we'll call it a night. If anybody has any questions, just you know, interrupt or whatever. Okay, so from a, a respiratory emergency standpoint, you know, the only time thing we'll have uh, time to talk about tonight is, uh, I guess we'll do asthma because that's the the main one that we see. Um, just if you ever hear of the barrel chest in an emphysemic patient, that's a barrel chest in emphysema, obviously a dead emphysemic patient, but that's a barrel chest. What happens is because they're struggling to breathe for, you know, years, they get, they're very thin and they they have this very exaggerated chest because they're using all these muscles to breathe and stuff like that. Uh, early on, emphysemics tend, again, they still are very thin, but you don't see that barrel chest as much, okay? But later in life, you see that barrel chest. Um, I think, you know, auscultating for lung sounds, we always compare, right, one side to the other. So we don't go down one side and then down the other side. We always go back and forth. And what I do is I usually have the patient turn their head to the side, cough a little bit, maybe once or twice. That clears out, especially in old people that are sitting or laying a lot, that just clears out any residual junk that's down there. And um, then you just tell them, you tell them what to do. So you say, you put your stethoscope on there and say, breathe in, breathe out. Because again, some are inspiratory sounds, some are expiratory sounds. So by telling them breathe in, breathe out, especially because we don't do a lot of lung sounds, you at least know if you hear something funky, whether it's in or out, because you're telling them what to do. So we work our way down the front, we work our way down the back and then go laterally in the axillary area and listen that way. 
and that would be a, a good way um, to be able to listen to it. I gotta be honest with you, usually when I do the axillary area, I don't go back and forth. I usually go down one side and then go over and do the other side. I mean, but technically you're supposed to go back and forth. But when I do anterior posterior, I do go, you know, compare side to side. Um, you know, the different si uh, sounds, we talked about wheezing, we talked about, uh, we didn't talk about crackles, but crackles are basically the sound of fluid in the airway. So it could be uh, like a fluid, like in a pulmonary edema, or it could be like a wet pneumonia, you can get crackles. Ronchi is more of a mucousy, like infectious type of sound. Strider, we said is the upper airway sound. Okay, um, you know about oxygen. I'm just trying to see what else was important. Uh, just, I mean, I obviously, you know, that with kids, most of the times it's just okay to give them blow by oxygen if it's going to freak them out and make them cry or anything like that. Okay. So CPAP. Okay. So I know that you're all using CPAP now. Um, so, um, you know, obviously the first thing is it stands for continuous positive airway pressure. So what it means is that the air, the oxygen is coming out. Okay. Is running through a valve. And if the mask is tightly fitted to the patient's face, okay. It requires a certain pressure to be generated to patient to exhale. It has to exceed a certain pressure to be able to exhale. And why that's important is that if you have a tightly se a sealed mask on a patient's face and they have to have a certain pressure to exhale, it means that their airways are being expanded. So especially in patients who have problems with either tight airways like an asthma or airways that are filled with fluid, it helps to either keep the airway open or prevent the fluid from filling the airway. So it works very good. I really, really good in congestive heart failure, acute pulmonary edema patients. It works pretty good in asthma patients as long as they're young and you know don't have like weak respiratory muscles. Because remember, if it's hard to exhale, right, and they have weak expiratory muscles, you put it on them and they're only going to get worse because they can't exhale, they can't get rid of the carbon dioxide and stuff like that. Okay, um, so CPAP takes care of what they call air hunger. So the problem that we have and you've seen for years is that you put a non rebreather on somebody who's short of breath and they basically rip it off, right? Because they don't have oxygen hunger. They have what's called air hunger. So they don't necessarily crave a certain percentage of oxygen. They just wanna know that they can get a deep breath in. And when you put a non rebreather on them because there's not a lot of flow through the non rebreather, they feel almost claustrophobic. Like they don't understand what you're doing by putting that over their face because it becomes harder for them to breathe. They don't understand it has 100% oxygen. They just wanna be able to take a deep breath and get a lot of air into their lungs. So CPAP, when they do breathe in, gives them a lot of air. So it helps them with that. The problem is that CPAP is big and bulky and very claustrophobic. So you have to feel 100% confident in using it. And you're almost being like the used car salesman and kind of talking the patient into using it because you will have patients that get so frantic then they start trying to rip it off and stuff like that. And it's only you appearing calm and convincing them that it's good. Uh, we'll let them keep it on for a minute or two. And once typically they keep it on for a minute or two, they love it and they don't want to take it off. And, and then you've, you know, you've achieved. And it's not uncommon for us to have a really hypoxic, struggling patient in the field. And by the time we get to the hospital, they look good. And they, the hospitals almost look, the emergency room almost look like, well, why'd you put CPAP on? And they look pretty good, you know. Well, they look pretty good because we made them better, right? If you take the CPAP off them, they're going to go backwards. And just remember CPAP in a COVID environment is kind of like a no-no unless you have a viral filter. And even then, if you think you can make it in without CPAP, I still would because you're putting yourself at great risk unless you really have a PAPR device, right? The, the, the self-contained hood that has air pushing into it so that it's pushing outward through the collar that surrounds you so nothing can get back up, right? And and the way people who wear PAPRs actually contaminate themselves is taking it off. So like you're done with the call, okay? And you take it off. So you have your gloves on when you take it off. So now you touched it, there's all virus on it, okay? You take it off, you put it down, and then you have your gloves on. So then you touch your face, or as you're pulling your gloves off, you're not careful. Or the other thing, which I actually just did myself, I'm still waiting three or four days to see um, if I have it, is that I then, after the whole call was done, I had thrown the whole thing in the front seat of the truck and uh, I went to the truck and grabbed the hood with my bare hands and threw it in the garbage. And I went and sat down and started charting and I said, I didn't just do that, did I? And that's exactly what I did. I grabbed the, you know, the thing with my bare hands, the hood that just had been, you know, two feet away from a COVID patient and threw it in the garbage with my bare hands. So, I mean, obviously I washed my hands at that point, but it was probably 30 minutes after I already done all that. And I kept on trying to remember back if I touched my face 
you know, I'm hoping I didn't, but, uh, you know, who knows? So, um, so the best use is in pulmonary edema, congestive heart failure, right? Also pretty good in asthma. COPDers tend to be older, so you really have to watch it with them, okay? Now, respiratory failure is a little iffy because remember, and usually when a patient's going into respiratory failure, um, they start to decrease their mental status. So we know that for using CPAP in a patient, they have to pretty much have a normal mental status because they have to be able to work with you and follow commands. So the contraindications would be that they have some type of, they typically say an altered uh, Glasgow coma scale less than 13. So 15 is normal, 14, right? And then 13. So right now we're all probably around 13. It's the end of the day, we're tired, you know, and we're kind of like nodding off and stuff like that. So we're really probably we're like 14, but whatever. So if you have a patient, you know, that's kind of a little uptunded, then CPAP is not, okay? They have to be breathing on their own. It's not a ventilator, right? So they definitely have to be breathing on their own. They have to be able to sit up, okay? They cannot be, have a low blood pressure below 90. Now, the reason why is that, if they start with a blood pressure of 90, when you put CPAP on someone, you increase what's called the interthoracic pressure in their chest, right? So in other words, there's a certain pressure inside your chest. If, you, if that pressure increases, the low pressure blood vessels, the inferior and superior viva cava are not getting enough blood back to the heart because if you increase the pressure in their chest greater than the pressure in the inferior and superior vena cava, which are the last journey, right? The last veins back to the heart. So the pressure is not great. If you, um, if you, raise, if you raise the pressure inside their chest higher than that, then not enough blood is going to get back to the heart. So the way a pump works is that, you know, it needs fluid to come in one side to pump it out the other side. So if the heart's not getting uh, blood into the right side, then it doesn't have anything to pump out the left side. So you're going to take this blood pressure of 90 and drive it down even lower. Um, nausea, vomiting, because again, you have a tightly fitted mask on their face. If they vomit, it's just going to blow it into their lungs. And remember, we could take patients and make them nauseous and vomit by putting them in the back of an ambulance facing backwards and have somebody drive, you know, uh, you know, huh, what would be the right word, crazy, you know, to the hospital. And you should not use it on a trauma patient because you don't know if they have a pneumo or a, or a, a rip in their airway somewhere or something like that. So we don't use it in trauma, only medical patients. Okay. But other than that, it's a pretty good device. I mean, I have to say it really has made a big difference in the amount of patients that we intubate and stuff like that. Okay. Um, people with facial hair does not work because for it to work, it has to have a tight seal on it. So it doesn't really work with people with facial hair. Okay. Again, side effects would be you could drop their blood pressure because again, increasing the, uh, the interthoracic pressure, obviously you can cause a pneumo with it. So you're going to use it at risk. Remember COPD is in general at high risk for pneumos. So that's why I don't like it in, um, in uh, COPD ears. Okay. If they vomit, there's definitely a huge risk of aspiration. And if you see them going to the hospital with their eyes closed, it means that where the mask is sitting right up here is not tight and the air is blowing out and coming across their eyes and it's drying out their corneas. So that if you see them going to the hospital with their eyes closed, well, one, they could have died on you, but the, the other thing would be is um, it's probably doesn't have a good seal. So you just kind of take the mask and pull it down a little bit. So it's tightly, uh, you know, sitting on their nose. Okay, so again, it does require you be, be able to sell the patient to it. The PEEP that EMTs are allowed to use is 10. Uh, just realize 10 is low. There are people on home CPAP that, that have more than 10. Um, but on a BLS level, they pick 10. Um, so that's the other problem on a BLS level with CPAP is 10 may just not be enough for them. But uh, you definitely won't run into problems staying that low. You know, you definitely will have less problems at 10, but it may not actually help them. You know, the other day, there was a patient telling the crew, the BLS crew, you know, he, he used CPAP. So he kind of knew it. So he was helping them put them on, put the patient was helping the BLS put the CPAP on him. And uh, so he said, well, what are you setting it for? And they're like, well, uh, 10. And he's like, nah, he goes at night, I'm on 20. He goes, and I can't breathe now. So they're like, well, we can't do more than 10. He's like, well, I'll do more than 10 then, you know, and he, he was like fuddling with all the settings and stuff. Um, again, you know, there's all different types of CPAP. I believe the one you guys bought is similar to the one we use that has a built-in um, nebulizer. So you can actually give a treatment on it and it has a great mask and a great strapping system. So these were the original ones that were kind of cheap um, and stuff like that, but the new ones are pretty good um, and stuff like that. Again, you kind of constantly have to reassess patients when they're on CPAP. And if you do see them nodding off, you know, you have to see what's going on. You may have to actually just take the mask off and start bagging them and stuff like that. Okay. Um,
and you're not allowed to raise the CPAP pressures, right? For some reason, the new protocol, the first time it came out, EMTs were able to do 10 to 15. The new protocol just left it at 10, okay? Rechecking blood pressure just to make sure you're not dropping it. And if the patient really starts to go downhill, okay, just take the CPAP off and, you know, you may have to switch them over to a non rebreather or you may have to ventilate them depending on their mental status and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, that's a good stage picture. Uh, what else? So I don't think we need to talk much about that. I think we know how to do all this. Um, well, I don't think anybody's using the, uh, the old uh, Robert Shores and stuff like that. They were good devices. The problem was that people didn't know how to use them and they overventilated, but those are the old demand valves. Um, uh, obviously people, I haven't, I haven't seen a patient with a stoma, which is basically a surgical opening into their neck uh, in years. They typically have a cancer of their larynx. So they kind of cut out that whole area. Um, I haven't seen that in years, but if you did, okay, and you had to ventilate them, um, you ventilate through the hole because there's obviously less resistance. Um, sometimes it's, it's where they actually bring the trachea to the hole. So then the only way air can get into them is through here. Sometimes it's actually still connected up here. So you may actually have to close their mouth and nose and ventilate through here. So it really depends. If you can get chest rise, you know, just like this, then you don't have to worry about closing their mouth and their nose. People have a actual have a tracheostomy. So they have a, a tube through this little opening. The top of the tracheostomy actually has the same adapter um, like an endotracheal tube. So you, if you had to bag them, you could bag them right by attaching the endotracheal tube, but you just gotta be careful you don't pull out the tube. And also just remember the amount you have to squeeze this bag is gonna be minimal because every breath you squeeze is pretty much going right into the lungs. So it's gonna be very, very minimal bagging to, um, to have to get chest rise, okay? Uh, I thought I had something about asthma. Oh, okay, so problems, right? So we have a lot of different types of problems. Uh, I think I'd rather do asthma because we have more of it and maybe another night we'll do COPD and stuff like that. Um, but remember before I was telling you that with the emphysemic patient, the alveoli, instead of being separate rooms, become one big room. So they lose the inner walls and they get very floppy. That's the problem. In chronic bronchitis, it's people have the cells that produce mucus um, go into overdrive. And it's usually in response to smoking uh, for years or exposure to toxic chemicals, the sa same thing like emphysema. Nowadays, it's mostly smoking. Uh, and both of them have gone down because there's less cigarette smoking than there was years ago. Um, this is just so we see it later. This is the concept of mucus plugging. So our airways are aligned with mucus. The oxygen that we give people from an oxygen tank has zero, zero humidity, zero moisture in it. The body is not designed for that. Okay, now you have patients who are having trouble breathing, so they're breathing faster. Okay, so if you give them oxygen with zero humidity and they're breathing faster, what will happen is the mucus will turn into a plug and block off A. So here's a dead patient, right? Who they pulled out their lung, they opened up their bronchial to show you the mucus plug. Um, and that could happen, you know, and again, if you clog off enough bronchioles, you can kill a patient. So really any respiratory patient we take to the hospital with the exception of the pulmonary edema patient should be on humidified oxygen and all pediatric patients that we're giving oxygen to should be on pediatric. This is a very exaggerated mucus plug, obviously that was taken out of somebody. Again, I'm sure because of death, um, that's pretty rare. I mean, that obviously starts obviously in a main stem bronchus and then goes all the way through. So, so again, we wanna use humidified oxygen at a bare minimum on adults on COPD or as asthma patients and stuff like that. Remember, a uh, uh, humidified oxygen only works on a nasal cannula. It doesn't really work well with a non-rebreather. It, it, it would work on a simple face mask, but the problem with the non-rebreather is that it fills the bag up, so it doesn't really go in the, uh, in the patient as much. But it, you know, I mean, it won't hurt you to try it, but it definitely works better on a, uh, a nasal. And remember, you've never visited a patient in the hospital um, who is on oxygen where it was not running through a humidifier. So it's only EMS that does that. And we always get away with it because we say we have short transport times, but really would benefit the patient. And nowadays they're disposable, which means that you open it up, it's sterile, you open it up, you know, you have to know how to hook it up to your, your on, it only works on your onboard oxygen. It won't work on a portable, uh, but you just have to know, you got to pull off the green little nipple that's on the onboard make sure you don't lose it. And then you screw the, the um, humidifier up in place. And then on the humidifier is another little nipple that just plug your oxygen on. So the air comes down through the water and then goes back out that other nipple into your oxygen tubing. And then when you're done, you throw it away. So you don't have to worry about spreading disease or getting bacteria 
or anything like that in there. Okay, so asthma is what we call hyperactive airway disease, and it's episodic, which means that most asthmatics have very good days and not so good days. So they have episodes when they're having problems. The term exacerbation means it worsens, okay? And when somebody's having an asthma attack, the small terminal bronchioles that lead down to the alveoli spasm and get tight, and they have excess mucus production. Again, that's why it's important to put them on humidified oxygen. So it basically closes off their small airways and makes it very, very difficult for them to get air out. Because again, on the way in, it's more forceful, at least initially. So they open up the airways and get air in. But when they exhale, it's passive. So it's hard for them to actually get air out. So they retain a lot of CO2, okay? Um, so again, it's usually on the way out, not on the uh, way in. But as they get worse, it'll be both ways. Um, so the big treatment for asthmatics we know is to give them nebulized albuterol, okay? But that requires the patient to be conscious, alert, and oriented. Um, and being able to hold the nebulizer and do it. So if they waited too long to call us, it may be a big problem because again, if they're unconscious, we can't use CPAP, okay? And we can't use a nebulizer. So at that point, we're kind of just stuck bagging them and getting them to the hospital and stuff like that. Uh, and then I think I have, uh, well, again, you know you are allowed to assist a patient with a meter dose inhaler. Meter dose inhalers work better if you use a spacer. Okay, and remember for meter dose inhalers, you, you shake it up, okay? You have the patient put it in their mouth, ideally using the spacer. They usually take whatever their prescription is, one puff or two puffs, and they slowly breathe it in and hold it for a second, okay? Hold it down there for a second. Um, if they give a little cough, that's good. That means they're actually starting to open up, just like when they're taking nebulizer, if they give a little cough, that's a good sign. Um, and again, I think by now everybody knows how to put together a nebulizer, but that's more of a, you know, a skill session than a lecture. Um, I'm just trying to think what we could talk about. Um, so all the other things, age and stuff like that, we know came out, right? They don't have to be between one and 65 anymore. The new rule is if they're wheezing and they're having trouble breathing, you can give them uh, albuterol. So you're talking now albuterol is in the asthma protocol and al albuterol is in the anaphylaxis protocol. Um, again, it's always secondary to epi. So if somebody's truly having anaphylaxis, you give them epi first. And then if they can, if you, you know, um, have given them your two doses of epi and they're still wheezing, uh, you can start switching over to albuterol, or maybe you stabilize their blood pressure, but they have a residual wheeze. So at that point you can give them, you know, albuterol versus more epinephrine because epinephrine is more stimulating to the heart. But in asthma, we only can use epi in a dying patient. We'll talk about that in a second. And in anaphylaxis, epi is a standing order. And asthma, it's only a medical control option. We can't do it on our own say so. So albuterol is a good drug. It's a very quick acting bronchodilator. It does have some side effects, right? If you've ever used it, it does make people a little jittery, does increase their heart rate a little bit and stuff like that. So it definitely does it. It comes prepackaged and as 2.5 milligrams of the drug and three mLs of solution. That's even in the pediatric patient, it's all pretty standard. Although a lot of kids don't use straight albuterol, there's a kind of a chemically altered version of it, um, you know, that they uh, they typically use on kids. But again, the one time we give it to them, it's, it's not a problem and stuff like that. We typically run the nebulizer at either four or six liters. We usually use six. Uh, too slow doesn't nebulize it, too much just wastes it and stuff like that. You don't have to delay transport to give them a nebulizer. You could do it in route, okay? And you're allowed to give up to three doses. So you can give one dose, a second dose, and a third dose if they're not feeling better after each dose. And do not fear giving them three. Again, if you have short transport, you just won't have time. But uh, don't fear because they do get back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back albuterol treatments in the hospital and stuff like that. Um, so here I wrote, you must call medical control for these things. It's not a must anymore, but it used to be that patients had significant cardiac issues that we had to call medical control for permission, but that's not true anymore. But just to realize you have to use it with some question then and stuff like that. I've never seen anybody allergic to albuterol, but obviously people can have allergies to the preservatives and stuff like that. And if a patient's in respiratory failure, which means their mental status is starting to decrease and all that stuff, they may not be able to use it. Um, so at that point, it's probably just a bag valve mask and stuff. But you, if you can get them on CPAP before they lose their level of consciousness and you can have CPAP with a nebulizer built in, you'll get better penetration. So it'll work, uh, it'll work much quicker. Remember up to three doses. Um, so the second dose probably will go in a little quicker than 10 minutes, to be honest with you. So as soon as you finish the first albuterol treatment, you start the second one. You do know that like, I don't know, five minutes into an albuterol treatment, it's not misting as much, but there's still plenty of albuterol. The problem is that it's kind of all stuck up 
more towards the mouthpiece. So what you do is take it out of their mouth, you just bang it a little bit, and then you give it to them and they'll get another minute or two um, before you give it to them. It's better to encourage them to breathe deeply and hold it for a second than to breathe fast and shallow because it has to get down to the lungs. So say like every third breath, I want you to take a little bit of a deep breath, hold it for a second. And when you see them actually coughing, but it's a very distinctive, like weak cough, it's like a <laughs> like they can't catch their breath, that means it's starting to actually open up um, and work and stuff like that, their bronchioles, okay? Um, so I usually assemble, this is called the egg corn or the, the medication chamber. I usually assemble this and pour it down here. Then you put the T piece, right? So this part goes over here and then you put the mouthpiece and it goes here. Some of them have a little corrugated tubing that come off of them. Again, this is how we carry it where it's all packaged together. Um, Oh, just one little interesting thing with this. I'm sure you've all had this. If you have one finger here and one finger on the back, right? So you're holding it kind of like this and you twist the top off, you twist this off, it's gonna spray um, out, not all of it, but you're gonna definitely spray some of it out. So put one finger on the side and one finger on the side, there's a little spine and it doesn't, not as much comes out. Some will come out still, but not as much, okay? And then obviously to get it all out, you have to squeeze it, turn it upside down, right? And pour it down into here, screw this on here and then pour it down in here. Uh, that's with the corrugated tubing, okay? This is a nebulizer mask. Um, most people don't carry these. I mean, you can, we have them, but very rarely use them. What happens is if a patient for some reason can't hold a nebulizer, so what you do is you put this all together and you get rid of this and this, and this plugs in right here to the bottom of the mask and that's it. Um, if you don't have it and you want to make it, you can take your non-rebreather, grab the bag really firmly, pull it out, pull the gaskets off that are on the side of the mask, and you have one if you know if you have to make one and stuff like that. Okay, so the last thing, for some reason I didn't see it here, was the epinephrine, um, epinephrine in um, severe asthma. I don't know why I don't see it, but I should have had it in here. So if you have an asthmatic that waited for a long time for to call you and you get there and they're you know no longer conscious, barely breathing, hypoxic, low pulse ox, basically dying in front of you. And they're gonna be hard to ventilate because again, their lung fields are so tight. So as a last ditch effort, you could call medical control and request to use the, your epi, right? Whether it's an auto injector or check and inject, just like you would an anaphylaxis, except it's a medical control option because it's so rare you're ever, ever gonna have to do this. I'm talking like, probably never have to do it, right? So rare we get asthmatics at that stage. But in that case, as a last ditch effort, if medical control approves, you would give them a dose of epinephrine the same way you dose it in anaphylaxis. So if they're over 66 pounds or 30 kilograms, they get the 0.3 milligrams, the adult dose. If they're under 66 pounds or 30 kilograms, they get the pediatric dose, which is 0.15. Still an intramuscular injection, nothing changes. It's just that it's, it's only a medical control option. Okay, and what happens is epinephrine, right, is a very potent bronchodilator. So that the problem with asthma is it's bronchoconstriction. So it will open them up, okay? So again, because they're hypoxic, it's gonna put a great load on their heart, but they're dying. So you have to do what you have to do. Okay, so you guys were great. Kept you a little longer than I wanted. You all look like you're still somewhat conscious. Those that you actually have pictures of you, you know, actually live. Um, so anyway, does anybody have any questions on anything before I let you go? Okay, you don't have to do the test tonight. If you're already tired and stuff, you could do it a different night. But anyway, everybody have a great weekend. Okay, it was nice seeing everyone. And uh, you know, hopefully at some point uh, in the springtime, I'm hoping we'll be able to meet in person. But uh, you know, now we're waiting for the you know, the bump from Christmas and New Year's to occur. But, you know, hopefully between the vaccine and um, getting away from the holidays, we should uh, we should at some point have less and less uh, COVID. I don't know quite how I'm going to lecture in person with a mask on. I haven't figured that out yet, but we'll be quicker, quicker sessions, I guess. So everybody have a great weekend. It was nice seeing everyone. And uh, if you know anybody who missed it and wants to do it, then just tell them to shoot me an email. I'm going to, I'll upload it to YouTube and, uh, you know, it'll be up there. They could watch it and they could take the quiz. Okay, and I'll, oh, send out, I'll send out the quiz now, uh, but I only sent oh, it to, yeah. um, I sent it to Mike, King, Eileen, Frank Cassonite, Joanne Cheney, and, and Kelly uh, at Pine Island. So they're going to re-forward it out. So it may take a second or two to get it re-forwarded out. Okay, and if you don't get it, you can just call them and just tell them to re-forward it out because I didn't have everybody's uh, time to put everybody's email address in it. Okay.
Did you have something, Art? Uh, no, I was just wondering if the test would be available tonight. It's it's going to go out now. Okay. Um, so to them, would, though. Yeah, but is Eileen on or is Mike on? I don't know. Do you have access to the whole um, Ambulance Corps email thing? Can you re-forward it if I send it to you? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> is anybody on from Greenwood Lake that has access to being able to re-forward it to the whole Ambulance Corps? I do. Who's uh, Miriam? Okay, I'll send it to you. And uh, then you can re-forward it out, okay? So and this, uh, email? What's that? You have my email? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, let me let me tell you what I have, and you tell me if it's right. Um, Miriam 8C at AOL. Yep. yep. Okay. Okay, so I will send you in the next couple of minutes, okay? So it was nice seeing everyone. Everyone have a good night, and uh, we'll pick Frank? up again. Yes. In Warwick, um, Eric, could you send it to Eric so we could send it out? What's Eric's last name? What's his last Fierstein. name? Fierstein? Yes, I have his email. Yep. Thank, thank you, Frank. Okay. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Frank. Have a good night. Have a good weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Yeah, bye. bye.